So hi everyone, good evening. My name is Dr. Thea Kirai Togle and I'm an assistant professor of women, gender, sexuality studies at UMass Boston. I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to the final GCWS Feminisms Unbound panel for the year titled Returns. So the Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women and Sexuality is a collaboration between nine institutions in the Boston area, Boston College, BU, Brandeis, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, Simmons, Tufts, and my home university, UMass Boston. The GCWS brings together feminist scholars and faculty from across our institutions and more through graduate level courses and a myriad of events every year like this one that you're in right now. The consortium is led by a board of directors. I guess I'm one of them, yes. <laughs> Composed of one faculty member from each institution. Um, and this is just a quick plug and announcement to say that you know, for faculty in the room, if you're interested in teaching for the GCWS, becoming a board member, or otherwise getting involved in the work that we're doing, such as putting on fabulous speaker series like the one tonight, please reach out to our program manager, Stacey Lance, or to contact the faculty representative at your institution, and we're all listed um, with names and images on the GCWS website. So just a couple of announcements quickly um, that this summer we're offering multiple courses and micro seminars for grad students of all disciplines at our member institutions. There are feminist, queer and indigenous methodologies, Latino, American, queer and feminist theory, affect, grief, activism, transforming pain into purpose in the aftermath of traumatic loss. And the last one is the Me Too movement and American sport. So um, I know Stacy is going to be putting in the chat a couple of links about our events, how to reach us, how to teach for us, and our upcoming courses. And with that, uh, welcome to the program tonight. And I will turn it over to Stacy, Faith, and our fabulous speakers. Wonderful. Thanks, Thea. Um, all right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Stacey. I'm the program manager for the GCWS, and I'm excited to welcome you. This is our final Feminism Unbound panel of the year, and we're really grateful to all of the speakers who are sharing their research and expertise today, uh, in addition to all of you for being in attendance. And I also really want to recognize that this is our final panel with the current curation team, which is Alora Chowdhury, Kareem Kuchandani, and Faith Smith. And it's been really incredible working, creating, and imagining alongside all of you for the past four years. I'm definitely going to miss um, our planning meals and all of the fun emails that we've sent back and forth. Um, and I know it's been really hard to do the last two years as a remote team and not have things in person and go out to dinner afterwards. But, you know, it's been really wonderful working with, with all of you. Um, so... You know, as we all come together from wherever you might be, um, please recognize the indigenous and native caretakers of the lands that you are from and that you currently occupy. Um, if you don't know who these peoples are, then commit to learning. The GCWS and our member institutions occupy land of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag peoples. And we recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty and territory perpetuation perpetuated um, by colonialism and our own actions and inactions today. Um, we don't take land acknowledgements uh, lightly and I encourage you all to, to take land acknowledgements lightly. They're part of a greater work and responsibility that are towards land reparations and returns and honoring indigenous practices that support, nourish and respect the land and the people. So let's take 30 seconds to just breathe and center ourselves during this time, ask your body what it needs to be engaged in this space. Notice where you might be holding stress, um, lots of stress and let it, let go of what, what you can at night, not always be possible. So just take 30 seconds with me. All right, wonderful. So we welcome you all to engage with each other during the webinar through the chat. Um, and please add any questions for our panelists to the Q&A. We're gonna pose questions to our speakers after they've each had a chance to present. And when, when applicable, just 
notate who your question is directed towards and you're also going to be able to upload questions that other people ask. If you want to see the closed captioning, just hit the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom. And lastly, again, thank you all for joining. And we can please turn our attention over to Dr. Faith Smith of Brandeis University, who will be moderating the panel tonight. Thanks so much, Stacy. Um, I'm Faith Smith. Welcome, everyone, of Brandeis University. I want to welcome you this evening and to thank my co-conspirators in the um, Feminism's Unbound series, Ella or Chowdhury of UMass Boston and Kareem Kupchandani of Tufts, and to salute in particular Stacy Lance, who always, but particularly in these recent tough times, holds us together and supports and pushes this work. I want to welcome all of you and to introduce our guests in the order in which they will um, make their initial presentations. Brandon Callendo um, is, is a professor at Brandeis University and specializes in black and queer literatures with a budding interest in board games and horror studies. He is interested in how black and queer writers, viewers and players are able to find affirmation in subcultures, genre and spaces that often fail to acknowledge them. His current book project, The Charge of the Other in Black Gay Men's Literatures, examines eccentric expressions of desire and belonging that test the limits of respectability and solidarity. His courses at Brandeis, where he teaches in the English department, include Getting Behind in Black Gay Men's Literature, Black Joy, Blackness and Horror, and Ghosts of Race, about ghost stories as a genre of exp exploration for Black artists and with its explicit invocation of hauntings that drag us back to a brooding past demanding remembrance or worse, retribution. Welcome, Brandon. Um, Harleen Singh, Professor Harleen Singh is the director of the Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis, where she's Associate Professor of South Asian Literature and Women's Studies. She co-founded the South Asian Studies Program at Brandeis and served as its chair from 2007 to 2016. She's a faculty representative to the Board of Trustees. Her writing on novels from India and Pakistan on Indian film and book reviews on hip hop music, sexuality and feminism have been published in various leading journals. Her chapters on women warriors and South Asian women writers are included in um, seminal book collections. And her monograph, The Rani of Jansi, Gender, History and Fable in India from the University of Cambridge Press 2014, interprets the conflicting mutable images of a, of a historical icon as they change over time in literature, history and popular culture. The book is in its second reprint and has been reviewed in The Telegraph, Economic and Political Weekly, The Book Review, um, Biblio and South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies. Her interdisciplinary work in English, Hindi, Urdu, and Punjabi is focused on women, history, politics, and identity in literature and film. Her next book, Contemporary Debates in Postcolonial Feminism, is being published by Rutledge in 2021. I'm sorry, was published by Rutledge in 2021. Her current book projects include a critical translation of Amrita Pritam's seminal partition novel, Pinjar, and a monograph titled, Half an Independence, Woman, Violence, and Modern Lives in India. She's a recipient of the ACLS Burkhart Fellowship and was a resident fellow at the National Humanities Center. Professor Rinaldo, Rinaldo Walcott, is um, Professor of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies in the Women and Gender Institute, Gender Studies Institute, this all at um, the University of Toronto. Um, so Professor of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies in the Women and Gender Studies Institute and a member of the graduate program at the Institute of Cinema Studies at the University of Toronto. From 2002 to 2007, Ronaldo held the Canada Research Chair of Social Justice and Cultural Studies at OISE. Ronaldo is the author of Black Like Who? Writing Black Canada, 1997, with a revised second edition in 2003. He's also the editor of Rude, Contemporary Black Canadian Cultural Criticism from 2000, and Queer Returns, 
Essays on Multiculturalism, Diaspora and Black Studies, 2016, with Idil Abdillahi, he co-authored Black Life, Post BLM and the Struggle for Freedom, 2019, and is the co-editor with Roy Boodley of Counseling Across and Beyond Cultures, exploring the work of um, Clement Vontras in clinical practice. Rinaldo's teaching and research is in the area of Black diaspora cultural studies and post-colonial studies, with an emphasis on questions of sexuality, gender, nation, citizenship, and multiculturalism. As an interdisciplinary Black studies scholar, Rinaldo has published in a wide range of venues. His articles have appeared in journals and books, as well as popular venues of newspapers, magazines, and, and online venues, as well as other forms of media. Um, two books appeared last year, The Long Emancipation, Moving Toward Black Freedom from Duke University Press, and On Property, which was shortlisted for the Toronto Book Award. He was born in Barbados. Shala Talebi of Arizona State University is a sociocultural anthropologist and, and associate professor of religious studies and the anthropology of religion of the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies at Arizona State. Her book, Ghosts of Revolution, Rekindled Memories of Imprisonment in Iran, 2011, won that year's Outstanding Academic Title Award given by Choice Magazine, and was the co-winner, the gold medalist co-winner of the 2012 Independent Publisher Book Awards. Dr. Taleb's work has also appeared in various academic journals, including an edited and in edit um, and in edited book volumes. Her article on revolutions in recent Iranian history was published in the Oxford Handbook series in July, 2018. She was a 2017 to 2018 Anthony K. Fellow at Nas the National Humanities Center, working on her book about contested memories of martyrdom in post-revolutionary Iran. And so we issued the invitation um, to, in we invited panelists to think about um, different routes into this question of return. Return suggests resumption and rootedness with attendant notions of convention, propriety, origin. If it is commonplace to invoke detour and roots to counter these conscripted, um, conscripting tendencies or to question the desire for returning to normal in, a, in these years that have starkly illuminated the inequities that we've learned to live with. Are there also registers of precarity that may make return inviting or comforting? How is the returnee potentially persecuted, forced out to secure borders in one space or welcomed back as privileged national subject in the other? Return transforms the space of presence into perpetual deferral, into a scene of waiting, an interregnum. Repatriated cultural artifacts press us to imagine imperial histories of violent accumulation, as well as orders of value, as in the assessment of returns on an investment. Finally, if return also suggests that which perpetually haunts, the refusal of what has been violently disappeared to stay away, then what are the spiritual practices that either counter or invite such visitations? Um, so the panelists will proceed in, in that order. And then um, we'll ask them if they have questions for each other and then open up the floor. Welcome again. Thank you so much, Faith and everyone for this, this fantastic introduction and to be able to sit in conversation and company with y'all on Zoom. Um, I'm gonna start right in because I, I plan to take probably my whole 10 minutes. Um, Today, I'll be taking up the last sweep of our proposal, which concerns haunting as a refusal of the violently disappeared to stay away and doing so within the locus of horror studies, Black horror studies. I'm intrigued by a looped claim convened by Black horror studies, Kenetra Brooks, Misha Wester, um, Robin Coleman, Leela Taylor, that define Black life in terms of horror and more directly through the idioms of haunting. The writer, Walida E. Marisha, pens a foreword to the 27 land 2017 landmark collection of horror studies written by Black women, the daughters of Sycorax, in a way that sets the everyday horrors of Black life over those posed by the supernatural. In her foreword, Imarisha notes that next to, when I do this, it means quote, 
um, gentrification, white supremacists, brutal cops in the ultimate horror story, slavery. Devils and vampires were almost banal. She continues, it's a long quote, but I want it with us. While the larger white society lives in terror of liberated blackness, of the demons unleashed coming after them, we know many of our spirits haunt us out of love, out of a desire for all that was unfairly stolen from them. And we need them because sometimes all we have is our ghosts. As hip hop MC King said, I'm happiest when I'm haunted. It means I'm not forgotten. Reading this collection, I breathed in these stories and the monstrous resurrection they carried inside them. They have stayed with me, haunting me, some of them hurting me. And I do not want them to leave because they bear witness to the ways we live with the past that is not past every moment of the day. Such ghostly visitations for Imarisha reverses how I tend to imagine haunting as fidelity to the dead. In her rendition, it isn't simply that the ghost haunts because she fears she'll be forgotten by her descendants, but rather that the ghost fears that if she does not return, her descendants will think that she has forgotten them. So the ghost for Imarisha returns as witness and as contemporary for how Black women continue to endure an American horror story that need not distinguish between past and present. Imarisha's desire to remain haunted here resembles that of Denver from Toni Morrison's Beloved. None but Denver, Morrison writes, knew the downright pleasure of enchantment, of not suspecting but knowing the things behind things. None could appreciate the safety of ghost company. In the different account of haunting I'll offer today, it will not be so easy to know the things behind things, nor to feel oneself haunted in those, way that, those ways laid out by the daughters of Sycorax, for the daughters of Sycorax. It is the ability to feel haunted, to experience that connection to one's ancestral past that I wanna unsettle a bit by now turning to the work of the author and historian, Taya Miles. With Miles, the yearning for visitations from the Black past, for the safety, the knowledge of ghost company, runs up against the commodification of it by mass culture. And though most of what I'm looking at today is going to be situated in Black horror studies, which is a recent interest of mine, it does dovetail really nicely with my work on Black queer literature, so I'm happy to draw on that. What both projects do share is a kind of desire to look at the way that the, the project of experiencing return is, is sort of muddled a bit. And instead there's a kind of smudged feeling of connection to an ancestral or diasporic past that's been commodified. Taya Miles' 2015 ethnography of haunted plantation tours, Tales of the Haunted South, touchingly documents her attempts to separate fact from fiction while going on several haunted plantation tours. Miles's archive is steeped in low forms of mass culture, gossip, midnight ghost tours, pamphlets and small press books, spectacularizing voodoo rituals or ghost hunting television shows reporting to have captured the screams and footage of popularly enslaved ghosts. And yet, rather than simply be debunking these as falsities, what strikes me most about Miles's most rigorous work is her sincere aspiration to feel haunted by mass cultural forms. These ghost tales always initially seem to take her in, to overwhelm her with the possibility that they might be true. And so though a trained historian, she moves away from secular reason, from academically sanctioned genres of history, to place herself under the sway of sham tourist guides and digital ghost hunting apps, all promising that their place is so bad that if she goes there, these things will happen to her too. So Miles writes, hearing an emotionally laden tale while occupying the space where the story occurred created an intense feeling of connection and horror for me. It was as though I could see right through the walls of this house of bondage. On the other side were people trapped in an intimate triangle of corruption made possible and authorized by a system of chattel slavery. The house of bondage becomes again and again what Miles calls only a few pages later a house of cards, a flimsy collection of half truths and contrivances that falls in the minute she begins to research them. Toni Morrison may write, um, therefore, of the prevalence of haunted houses in Beloved, noting that there's, this is a quote, not a house in the country ain't packed to its rafters with some dead Negro's grief. But in today's climate, the specter of some dead Negro's grief 
has produced in the American South a cottage industry for dark tourism, its tragic and overly sexualized mulattoes forever returning to wander the halls, its abusive plantation mistresses still flogging, and the bustle of slaves still toiling as specters in the plantations long after their bodies should have gone to glory. The return of the enslaved in Miles's ethnography of haunting is not a spiritual affair. It is the return of the slave, the commodity, as commodity. The slave only returns to Miles now in the hands of white tour guides who know how to work her grief for profit. The slave woman's tragedy and her obscurity become our titillation, her rape, our romance, and the labor and violence that she endured in life is, Miles shows, still able to turn a profit for the plantation even in death. Haunting in the field of dark tourism is not the refusal of the violently disappeared to stay away. It is the violence of calling them back to replay forever their scenes of subjection, their monstrous intimacies in spectral loops. And there's a poet I'm interested in, Claire Cronin. She's a, um, a white poet who doesn't really deal with race in a way that, that, that compels me. But there, there's one moment where she's writing about horror movies. She talks of going to a haunted plantation tour and how she sees a lot of the tourists laughing at the idea that grief could leave, leave a stain. Um, Cronin writes, the ghost tour, like the ghost hunt, is about the sadism of the living. We want the dead to suffer for our pleasure to continue to perform their deaths in excruciating loops because we find the spectacle of this idea thrilling. These excruciating loops of black suffering still offer Miles shimmering promises of connection. In haunted plantation tours, the commodification of black life is redoubled, and yet Miles still wants to believe what the tour guide says are true. Drawn to study such women as Molly, Chloe, Cleo, these women are only given by their first name, or Marie Laveau, she discovers, after having connected with these stories, that some of these women never even existed. The visitation that she was on the brink of experiencing from the past was but figure and figment of a white mind as it continues its centuries-long trafficking in Black life. And so while doting on the seeming sincerity of tour guides, how genuine she says they seem, how sincere she says they seem, she waits spellbound in plantations at night for the human to return to her from the commodity form. And yet immersing herself in this contemporary mania for ghost stories, what she calls ghost fancy, still allows her to know something of the things behind things. Um, they allow her to contemplate the novel, for instance, that she's writing about black and indigenous histories that she's carrying in her purse. Miles's ability to experience the subaltern past returning, at least as she represents it, is deeply compromised because they are deeply mediated by the finesse and fabulations of the tour guides who wish to mitigate the tourist discomfort. She observes, although the psychics ask the slaves to speak, thereby offering them the agency that comes with voice, speech is only possible through mediums, psychics not of African descent, Black slaves' stories of suffering, accommodation, and even defiance are thus filtered through professionals with a commercial interest in the ghost tourism trade. The resurrection of the slave in the ghost tourism trade is here but a second servitude that complicates how we might understand the work of recovery and return in Black feminist histories of haunting. How do you lay to rest the spirit of a Black woman who may never even have existed at all, but who certainly was real for you. She existing only in brochure, only in gossip, only in the belched up dreams of the plantation touches you, permits you the fantasy of her return. Miles' study of haunting haunts haunting as a language of black feminist inquiry. It returns us to a different sense of haunting where the black feminist historian's ability to experience the return of the past remains posed in an anticipatory state of deferral. Her camera out, her pen ready, in plantations at nights, she waits. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll go right ahead. Thank you so much, Brendan, first of all, for starting us off on this wonderfully poetic journey. Um, it's just it was extraordinary. Um, I have taken um, uh, the invitation of feminism unbound um, to really 
um, unbound. So you'll have to forgive me for what is uh, very much, uh, very unlike the work that I usually do, very unlike the scholarship that I usually do, but I thought if I can't take some chances here, then, then where? So uh, bear with me as we move through it. Um, and, and I just want to call out that, you know, in some ways it's, um, Brendan and I are talking to each other right now because um, as Brendan is bringing through the history of, and, and bringing out authors and bringing out the poetry of things, um, I take um, four lines of poetry and then start from there to talk about my ruminations on the ideas of the dead. Um, so in a way, none of it is quoted here, but I all of the, what Brendan said is, is in my head as I'm thinking about all of these things. So I'm going to start with four lines from a poem uh, for Requiem for a Friend by uh, Rena Maria Rilke, translated by Stephen Mitchell. These are the last four lines of, of the piece and, and it's, it's, he says, do not return if you can bear to stay dead with the dead. The dead have their own tasks, but help me if you can without distraction as what is farthest sometimes helps in me. So I start with the first phrase, do not return. To be rooted, one must have a place of origin. We begin, we grow and hold steady to that beginning even as we branch out. But what seems biological, even logical, is rather the foundational myth of home, where one can gather the pieces and rest, even from afar. But what do we make of home and returns when we have never belonged? We lay claim to this displacement through history, through race, through gender, through sexuality, religion, and so much more, as if displacement is the only steady narrative of our lives. What of return then when we have been scrambling to simply lay claim to where we think we began? The next phrase, is if you can bear to stay dead with the dead. To accept where we are is to accept the deadness of some lives. Judith Butler and others have thought about it more carefully as grievable and ungrievable lives. I'm calling it a story of deadness. How certain realities must stay half lived, half named and half sung. To stay dead with the dead we have to be able to accept the impossibility of return. The immigrant, the woman, the queer must make their lives elsewhere with the other dead. The next phrase says, the dead have their own tasks. What can we do then in this middle ground of living? Writing and research is one of our own tasks to which we return. In solidarity with the dead, we create voices, rituals, pleasures, and excess. And excess not as more than needed, but excess as out of bounds, as the unbound, as the impermissible. But do we then draw sustenance from these tasks and find logic and rhythm in their unfolding? Or have we folded too easily into the margins of deadness? Where is the rebellion? Where is the undoing? but help me if you can without distraction. But even in the deadness, there is a call for help, for the existence of the dead is what gives meaning to the living. They are where we begin and to whom we return. With our dead behind us, we actually make a business out of this living. Our names, where we come from, the names we give our children, all this is less about us than it is about the dead that sustain us. Whether it is a dead mother, an unnamed woman raped and murdered in a bus, or the many dead of the wars around us, we live because we are not them. We acknowledge them, we know them, but we are not them. They ground us without distraction. And the last phrase of the, of the lines, as what is farthest sometimes helps in me. This phrase, perhaps in translation or in the poetic, carries the contradiction. The dead, the home, our place of origin is farthest from us, and yet with 
in me. This is the yearning of return, of not being able to, of not knowing where to return to. We are then these fractured histories of not knowing, not belonging, of not being. What then of the queer dead, of the immigrant who cannot be burned to his own songs of religion, or the labor that built the dams, the railroads, and the fields of food, of the triple binds of sexuality, race, and citizenship? What, of, what hope of return then for those for whom home has never existed? Does the writer, the artist, the gardener, the teacher, the runner return to their steady task, not to create a new, but to find a place to return to? Do we, as Conrad once wrote in quotes, live as we dream alone? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to begin with a quote from Dion Brand. Um, it's a quote that has been organizing my thinking around questions of diaspora and return from the very first time that I read it. So Dion Brand writes in A Map to the Door of No Return. Migration, can it be called migration? There's a sense of returns and migrations, a sense of continuities, remembered homes, as if with birds or butterflies or deer or fish. Those returns which are lodged indelibly, unconsciously, instinctively in the mind. But migration suggests intentions or purposes, some choice and if not choice decisions, and if not decisions, options, all be there difficult. But the sense of return in the door of no return is one of irrecoverable losses of those very things which make return impossible. A place to return to, a way of being, familiar sights or songs, familiar smells, a welcome perhaps, but a place welcome or not. And so my brief meditation here at, to, in this conversation with colleagues is to think about the promise, disappointment, and the impossibility of return in diaspora. So, um, you know, the standard ideas of diaspora is that one is dispersed from an original homeland that one might be able to return to, but it imagines a homeland. And of course, um, I don't think of diaspora in that way of all, but I think about diaspora much in the way of Stuart Hall's articulation in cultural identity and diaspora, which is the second moment, which is that diaspora is the opportunity to create new forms of identity, new forms of hybridity, and, and the term that I prefer much more than hybridity, new forms of creolization. But I think that diaspora also holds for us the key to a range of other kinds of returns that do not specify the return to an originary homeland, but rather specifies a return to questions of life, questions of the human, questions of emancipation, questions of freedom, and of course, fundamentally, a return to the scene of colonization and transatlantic slavery. So for me, the question of return is a question of the modern, um, and it's a question for intellectual debate. And here, when I think then of how we might pursue that intellectual debate, I think of Saidia Hartman's Lose Your Mother and the disappointment of return, but the generative intellectual incitement that a failed return might offer us, um, an, an incitement to think differently about the question of Black life, about what comes to constitute something that we call in the aftermath um, of European coloni co colonial adventures, Africa. Um, so return for me encapsulates 
and holds together a particular kind of a political and intellectual agenda um, that is driven by an, excite, an incitement to thought. And that incitement to thought um, really um, comes together for me around the question of queerness and what queerness might do in the world. So for me, diaspora is queer and always is a queer formation. But for me, return is a queer practice. Um, and so I brought together a collection of my essays and I called them queer returns. And I called them queer returns for exactly the problematic that those essays were trying to explore, the tensions around um, queerness, blackness, multiculturalism, nation, state. And to return to those particular kinds of ideas through queerness is to queer return in a really fundamental way. It's to look askew, if you will, at those kinds of formations. So for me, the question of return is about also returning to bodies of knowledge. And today, I'll give you one example of what I mean by that. Today, I was um, on Twitter, I encountered two moments, but the first moment was really encapsulated by um, the journalist, journalist Hannah Nicole Smith, tweet, Hannah Nicole Jones, I'm sorry, tweeting about um, the don't say gay and the attacks on critical race theory and, and tweeted a formulation in which all the queers became white and all the blacks didn't seem to be queer. And so, you know, that really made me think about this kind of question that I know I was coming here to think about. So what might we return to in terms of return as an intellectual formation? And it immediately made me think of Cheryl Clark's essay, The Failure to Transform, as, you know, something that in a moment like that, that we can return to, to kind of clarify um, the, the problematics of how these kinds of singular formations of communities um, simply fail to reach at the complexity of what community might be. So for me, when I, when I think about that, the question of return, usually when people think of return, you think of returning to a past. But I think once one queries the question of return, um, that return is actually a kind of future oriented pedagogy. And so for me, in this moment of thinking about return, I return to the hold of the ship and I return to the question of black death as it is currently animated through questions of COVID. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. It is truly hard to follow these amazing, really amazing um, meditations. I don't even know how I'm going to do it. And I consider that informal, so uh, it's going to be quite informal. But it's very strange that what Renaldo, you kind of started, is very much what I was uh, thinking about, you know, it, this idea of return um also as a uh, queerness but uh, but as a future oriented idea rather than necessarily return to the past but the past in a sense that so i i i'm thinking of as we know and as as the organizers themselves have said in the abstract return has often been seen in connection to the roots to the origin um, and i'm kind of trying to think about the idea of the imagination of of the return and return in the sense of imaginary because it's always imaginary but this idea of return to the self to the childhood to this glorious times to and also in connection to trace to ruins to the scenes of violence returning to the deadly zones to this all these kind of contradictory things from harmony to oneness return to nothingness in a way, to non-being, to the time of no roots in, in, in a sense. Um, and return to the death um, as, as, and to the dead in the, uh, as uh, thinking about the future and as bringing the dead with one uh, to the future. And, and, and in that sense is very much something that I think 
is important to really think about, but return also as a promise. Um, in, in a sense of, uh, for instance, for those of us who have partaken in a revolution, return to the revolution is really not necessarily return to the time of the revolution as such, in uh, rather to uh, the dreams that one uh, was kind of contemplating at the time, but also to those dreams, one failed to actually even allow for the imagination to actually consider. And to, in that sense, I think is, is significant. So return if, uh, in a sense of the spatial and temporal, uh, as we've seen, are often, uh, especially nowadays, hit the, the, the boundaries and nation states and so on and so forth. But uh, the moment that one considers, for instance, in the context of those of us during the travel ban, at the Trump's travel ban, to, all, uh, to kind of see oneself uh, as other, regardless of if you're a US citizen or not, but if you're originally from somewhere else, it's a sense of actually um, reckoning with those who are always already the other and homeless in a sense, in a place like African American, Native American, so and so forth. So one, in fact, in that sense is a promise of, or at least a potential of a kind of solidarity with all these others that uh, do not find a place. Um, you know, when one thinks about, for instance, this idea that, um, that, that whiteness in a way, when racial designations were created, whiteness was not really in a sense registered as scholars have suggested uh, in a sense of racial because it was considered as a, a social norm. And I'm thinking about return to, for instance, um, motherhood or to femininity, not in a kind of, in a sense that is in a biological return that kind of is conventional social norm and so on and so forth, rather to a different kind of understanding of care, the labor of love, the labor of, labor of birth. So in that sense, thinking about, again, the work of revolution, the work of uh, kind of creating a place that is one understands that is never a place for, for oneself, but is a place that opens up and in that, that sense is the, the possibility rather than what, uh, what is actually really, uh, again, um, when one thinks about, for instance, the original home being always a place of potential in the case of the gay for in many places that, um, that, that, that it was suggested. And uh, for, for instance, in my case, return to home is impossible and being where I am, is constantly, you know, has this notion of, you know, where you're coming from. So in that sense, for me, rather than dwelling on what it is for me, it um, in, enables me to think about all these histories, um, you know, with Sadia Hartman, with Miles, uh, that you suggested, with many others, to think about the keepsake, for instance, is that right? Not necessarily simply as an object or a trace of a past, but the possibility of a storytelling and history, thinking with history that actually brings wisdom, or as Stefania Pandovo kind of said, has suggested, making one older, even as one is as one is young, because in a way, when when one leaves with these generations of death and histories, uh, and uh, of, of it in 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 that sense enriches, you know what one is one's own experience is, and instead of isolating experiences of my story and your story, it enables a different kind of understanding of ourselves. Um, you know, Edward de has talked has, has talked about the ecology ecologies of serfs, but re re reality is is much um, beyond uh, even human beings. In my own work, um, thinking about uh, return for me is also the possibility of reflection, the possibility of returning to to traces of my own work 
and thinking about what was missing and what I could I had missed in this kind of in a uh, sense that Vina does does when she returns to her own work and realizes what she had missed the, the first time. So it, it is an impossible in a literal sense as well by not being able to return to the field a dream of returning to the field that one goes back and creates a sense of intimacy, a sense of deeper trust, a sense of rootedness in a place that one considers and as one's ethnographic field, it creates a different kind of understanding. And, and in that sense, it forces me to go beyond the bonded field and consider the field itself as unbound and as something that is kind of hinderland in a sense of like Carpanzano, for instance, when he talks about it. It's, it's in that sense, for instance, the notion of returning to, to the childhood as Clara Hen, for instance, has argued, um, not as simply remembering, which is in and of itself, in a different sense, important, but for her, is imagining oneself as a child. And here, imagining oneself as a child, even if it's impossible, but allows one to actually see things from different perspective, from a way that, that constantly creates a sense of believing in the impossible. So in that sense, returning again to the past by uh, knowing the failure, instead of thinking about, oh, that has already failed, a, a failed project, but, um, but think about it as what was the potential that, that could have been really excavated from all that, all that, that got ruined or, or, or lost. So in that sense, dreaming is something that, um, that is the potential of a better world, a better future, a better connection and a better relationship that is not just simply among ourselves. So for me, as I was thinking about it, in the case of, for instance, activism, I was thinking about a different kind of activism that many people have, have of course, talk, talked about recently. Black Lives Matter, I think we saw so much of that already. Uh, that is a different kind of care is different kind of leadership even it, so it's it and and more importantly is it is is considering the motherhood not in, again as a um, in a sense of the biological sense but as creating a sense of attachment intimacy and yet being able to let go of the ones one is so much so attached to. So in that sense, I think is the possibility of living with the risk of always losing. And I think this is something that is, is really important because one of the things for me as and a scholar who has always also thought of activism as a significant part of who I am, the, the issue of, um, a failure and, and, and you know, constantly blamed for what one has done that has led to, you know, to uh, consequences that were not necessarily desirable. The idea of really thinking about what it is that, that one can grasp in these uh, forms of various forms of engaging, you know, for a better world with different uh, kind of uh, movements is really something that cannot, cannot be isolated scenes. Can, one cannot be an activist nowadays in my mind without thinking about race, without being uh, you know, anti-racist, without being anti-capitalist, without, think, without thinking about sexism and so on and so forth. So in many ways, I think return in that sense is return to actually to where um, is, is, is actually trying to uh, find new roots in a way that is actually rather than simply staying in one place is, is expansive and is in a way going beyond the, not simply the national boundaries, but is a different kind of friendship, is a different kind of care 
and is a different kind of relating even to the future in a way that uh, I, I, I always think about what Catherine Malibo and Derrida in a way were talking about as seeing what is, uh, what is to come, what is not completely hidden, but at the same time, not really visible. So the idea of return in, in a sense, both to something that is not there in the past, and yet one returns to imagine what it could have, what was there. And also the idea of what is in the future that we are actually really trying to fight for. And in that sense, what kind of solidarity, what kind of um, relation, relations uh, with the other is really necessary to create uh, that, um, that promise uh, and that, that future looking um, kind of idea of the return. So for me, return, thinking about return is not just simply about the scholarship, but is also an ethical uh, actual issue. Thanks so much to the ending on that note of an ethics of return in a way, I guess all the, all the presentations um, you know, in a way um, brought us there. So just, just trying to tease out some threads so far where we have return as, as loss, as an, as an impossibility, and also a, a chance to rethink, to create a new, um, a chance to reimagine a different kind of care. This very, very, um, uh, this was really powerful to me a return to, in, in the case of, of radical change or revolution, to what could not have been dreamed at the time. So that you, you go back to the moment, the, 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 so that the point is not to recover the chance to make that radical change, but to, um, because usually in fact, that is, that is not possible. But, but in fact, to go back and, and kind of rethink what, what did it mean to stand in that moment? What are, the, what are we now able to see that, 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 that was maybe covered over in the, in the kind of dreams that made it to the surface? What, what were some of the other possibilities? Um, what kind of failed return offer us? That, that, that idea is so powerful. And also this idea of seeing right through the wall that in, in, in one sense, and in the, first, in the first presentation, I can see right through because the past is so vivid, but I can also see right through because of the kind of flimsiness of the, of the, the, the kind of tawdriness of, of, of what has been reduced to the market. So the market made me think of capital. And at first I was thinking that in fact, the, the first presentation um, only, um, kind of gave us the market in terms of re return and accumulation and accruing interest. But actually, all the papers are circling this question of value um, and revaluing and diff differing orders of value. So, so in the, that final presentation, for example, the, the whole business of thinking differently about care and about temporality and so on. So I, I guess I'm inviting now the panelists to respond to each other. I mean, I, if I may, I'll, I'll take up a point that I think that that Sheila was making um, that resonates with me and, and, and one of the points that I have here in my notes, which is this kind of question of not the impossibility of a return to another place, but never actually arriving in the place that you are. And, and that for me, in some ways speaks back to Faith's, um, Faith's um, comment on, on, on ethics, because generally that kind of dynamic can be interpreted as being alienated from the place that you're landed in. But in fact, I think that there's a way in which we can recast that, this kind of um, always arriving but never arriving as a kind of new ethic of relations and a new, especially a new ethic of relation 
in the places that we land in that are colonized. Um, to think about never wanting to arrive because to arrive is to settle and to settle is to engage the colonizing project. So I, I just thought I'll throw that out because that that then places us firmly within the realm of the ethical in terms of how we think about return. So may I jump in? So um, I, you know, it's, it's uh, as we're talking about, of course, you know, Shahala, thank you so much for rooting us in the here and now in thinking about this. But I'm, I, you know, I'm also very interested in the ways in which return creates a kind of binary, right? You leave, you return, there's a point of origin and more. And I'm wondering about philosophical systems where there is no linearity of return and leaving, uh, or you know, leaving and returning or that, but there are these kind of worlds and swirls of lives. I mean, so if you, are, you come from systems where there's reincarnation and multiple lives and ways in which you're constantly circling and going back and forth and the world is illusion and it's a dreaming and it's so many different things that, that in a way to me, um, I'm wondering also how the idea of return for us is, especially when we speak in English, rooted in a particular kind of system of politics and governmentality where the, the parsing of borders or where we are from, passports of you know, how we enter and leave becomes the, the overarching logic of how we think about return, right? And, and, and I guess, um, you know, Part of what I was trying to do was also to um, to destabilize or to at least shift the grounds of philosophical inquiry into the notion of return. Um, if if there is no leaving or returning in terms of you know the physicality of, of borders and 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 places, but but really of of the ways in which we think of ourselves as who we are as people, and I think that's where I. I find that that invocation that Faith also brought up of this, this notion of um, returning to the moment of revolution with what we know. I mean, people often ask you, you know, what could you tell your 18 year old self right now? And, and, you know, and I'm always stumped a little bit by that question because my thing is, whatever I could tell my 18 year old self right now, I'm not so sure my 18 year old self would listen, right? So that there is this, this, this investment in what we know now as something that is more than what we knew then. Mm -hmm. but, but actually there's, there's, there's almost no way of knowing, you know? So, so I, I come to it with, with great humility and befuddlement and bewilderment because there, to me, it's such an excitement of, of, of ideas. Brendan, are you going to say something? I was just getting excited. I also, I drank a lot of caffeine, so it's, it's <laughs> maybe I can but one thing I love and share, and, and, some, and I think I saw this connection running through a couple, but certainly in yours, Harleen, um, is when you talk of that, that distinction between like, you know, what would my older self say to my younger self? Um, one of the pieces that I think of and was on my mind when you were speaking, um, your, your poem, your piece about the dead, is a poem by Melvin Dixon um, called Blood Positive, which is a dialogue between a younger generation um, of activists dialoguing with an older generation of um, men, black gay men, presumably, who had passed from AIDS complications. And the, the poem, the, the younger generation sort of chastising the older, um, the dead, and the dead say, leave us alone. We did nothing but worship our kind. And when you love as we did, you will know there is no life but this, and history will not be kind. Now take what you need and get out. And what I think of in that anecdote and what I think of in the sort of questions sort of hovering here with me is the, 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 the belief that the older me, right, might offer something to my younger self or the younger generation might know something that the older generation could not have known um, has a kind of, there's a binary there, I think, right? Where the, it, it's a question for me, I guess, of what the past might offer us as knowledge that may diverge from what we ourselves know in the present. And so in terms of, you know, say um, the poem that you, you shared with us or the line that you, you gave us, Harleen, the dead have their own tasks. There's a kind of lovely recognition of alterity within that. And so I think of what that means where in some of the language that was moving, I think in, uh, the, uh, uh, in all three of the, the presentations, the offerings um, was a sense of what might come from this deferred state of not being able to return that say in, um, in Shahala's sense of like, you know, when you're in a state of abandonment where you can't quite return yet, 
that, that there's a kind of sociality or connection that opens up with others who feel similarly abandoned. But I guess the, the question I have there is a wondering about how do we balance that other kind of ba um, binary self and other within those, within the scene of diasporic return, within the scene of who we want to return from the past, um, who returns to us in the past, and within these sort of intergenerational exchanges is just something that's um, sort of on my mind. Or lastly, I think, um, in terms of the kind of ways that we might stand, and this is in terms of, you know, Ronaldo's offering and thinking, the kind of affiliation that might be produced from diasporic rupture, I think here of Nadia Ellis's work on diasporic belonging as existing in a state of deferral of what becomes possible when you cannot return. Um, and so I just, I, I love, but I'm, I'm thinking about how we balance in those projects of return, the ability of the past or these other spaces um, of feminist inquiry to turn away from us and say, actually, we have our own tasks, you know, we're up to doing something, you know, all together different. So, uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's, hardly, I, I, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, they, we, we are asked that question, but that question, as you said, is almost like the return question. Is that right? Itself is uh, imagined because the idea is that what I know today, as, as you were saying, is more, is better than, or is evolved while what I'm trying and what I was trying to think about with return is actually to think about some of the, uh, the, 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 the for instance, the spirit, uh, the joy, the friendship, those things that were kind of true uh, imagining and true remembering those moments. In fact, to remember what I have, uh, Sorry, I may have actually forgotten today, as we know, most of the knowledge is already about, but we forget. Is that right? It's already always already somewhat there to some extent. So, in a sense, one may say, you know, we end up uh, kind of losing a lot of those like childhood, you know, fresh eye. Is that right? By seeing so many defeats and so much pain that the idea of actually risk taking for something better almost gets, uh, you know, kind of erased or fades away in, our, uh, in, in ourselves. It's almost like exhausting souls. So to return to that moment to remember how um, love was present, how care was present, how there was within all the chaos and everything, you know, so, so to, rem to see, you know, from behind, almost like looking back and looking at your dreams, one does not remember everything, but one can somehow pull, pull out some of those elements. I think for me, as I was thinking about, you know, um, that, that is the, it, the, actually the ethics of return the possibility and and you know um, i don't want to brandon i don't want to kind of romanticize this idea of not being able to return as something you know i mean to be honest but la last year i was thinking about where i'm going to go what happens you know uh, if i can't go back to iran and i can't stay here what will happen but but to be honest that very uh, idea made a different kind of relationship that, that I dreamed. I, I dreamed like every night about, um, about, you know, the way the settlement was happening here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's weird. It was like my cells were feeling that sense of all of a sudden losing, um, you know, what you thought was supposedly yours, you know, or you, th you thought you had come to create. So that sense of not ever arriving, I think is fantastic. Um, I, don't, um, I, I really agree that the, one has to learn this world with the idea that on the one hand, that is not about the past, it's about our future. It's something that is constantly there. So it's something that is to come. Is not just those who have gone, but for those of us who are going, is that right? And 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 on the other hand, is also about not ever getting comfortable with where you're sitting. That makes us to see who's coming, 
and those who are arriving, those who have arrived before us. So I think in that sense, probably thinking about return is really fascinating. So Ronaldo has a hand up just as I was, I had been thinking about this sentence, always arriving, but never arrive. To arrive is to settle, to engage in a colonizing project. And I was thinking about how a critique often leveled against us as you know um, the armchair class or whatever, is that we're we're judgmental of that kind of settlement, which what are we talking about? The mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so I I you we we I just heard encapsulated that tension between dreaming of, you know, you mean feeling displaced from there and here and 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 wanting to revel in what that can teach us right never arriving but at the same time that situation is anxiety producing it's stressful and so and so what happens when one romanticizes that that very condition so anyway ronaldo please go ahead i think that's a great set of questions faith and I guess one way I'll come back to it is it's like Harleen really um, set up what I think is the problematic for all of us who work through diaspora and, 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 and the transnational mm -hmm. around questions of, you know, the hard reality of borders, passports, visas, and so on. So there's that, there's that level, I think, of of the problematic of return, and then there, and and that can bring with it the kind a kind of nostalgia, um, and 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 I don't mean to I don't mean to dismiss nostalgia, but mm -hmm. it can bring with it a kind of nostalgia, and and again in, in terms of me always thinking with Dion Brand in some way, you know in 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 her long poem um, Land to Light On in which she gives up on land to light on, and she also gives up on, on country. But she oh, there's, this, there's this one tiny fragment in one of the lines in, in a part of the poem where she writes, and nostalgia is a lie. It's a eight hour flight somewhere back or something like that, right? And it's this kind of beautiful check in terms of how we might think about return. Because for many of us, return is not a physical return. It's heading down to the market and getting a mango. It is heading, right? So when Shayla raised the question of imagination, right? Um, that is central to how we might think through the problematic of return, um, which is not to say that one romanticizes never arriving, but one sees in never arriving the, the problematic of what is supposed to hold us. The question for me is the question of the nation state and always its insufficiency. So I was really captured by the idea of returning to the time of the revolution. And it really made me think of David Scott's second book, Refashioning Futures, where he raised the kind of question of what, when we return to the past, what are we returning to the past for? Um, that when we return to the past, we, we can't, or we can't use the past to ask the same questions of our present. That, the, that we return to the past to make sense of why the questions asked then might have failed so that we can do something different now. And so when I think about that, I start thinking about, okay, well, many of us are moving and have moved and remain unsettled in some way because this thing called the nation state remains insufficient. And so the, the kind of question then becomes to me, and again, I go back to Sheila, you know, the invocation, Sheila in, invoked the Rida and the Takam, and that's a phrase that in, in my last book, really, I, I use a lot, <laughs> um, this notion of Takam, because it's open-endedness, but it's drive for possibility, um, does something to, it does something else to settlement, right? So that we don't have to settle in land, we don't have to settle in nation state, and we don't have to settle for hard borders. We can settle someplace else. We can settle in imagination, as I think Brandon's opening comment 
um, really did when you were quoting from that person who I can't remember now, and they turned to the rap artist in their own quote, right? You know, I, what, what I thought was happening there was like this kind of profound pedagogy of the imagination to create new spaces and new opportunities for living, for living life. So I just want to get that on the table. If I could hop in real quick, um, that I, I mean, I wonder, I, I, I love this, this leveling, um, this different kind of reckoning with a romanticization of what, you know, the state of deferral might mean. Um, because I think in this, this comes on the, the back of what Ronaldo um, just offers, but in, I don't know how to put this, um, in thinking of nostalgia, say, it's a different kind of relationship. This was with me and Shahala when you were speaking as well, but a different relationship to the past. Like I think of, uh, it's actually on my, my, my desk right now, Afro Nostalgia, Feeling Good in Contemporary Black Culture um, by Badia Ahad Lagadi, where she talks about the need for um, Black subjects to be able to feel and experience kind of nostalgia and places that we can go back to, even if it's an imaginary project. And so the state of return isn't about trying to return to what's real or get at something which is true. It's about being able to, to create a way of belonging to more and more time periods rather than a history which can only harm you. And yeah. I think in that kind of way, just like lastly, that, that I wonder if that kind of, like I appreciate and understand the leveling um, the second reckoning with what romanticizing a state of deferral means and why, you know, our, our armchairs, we might come back to it. But I think, too, of what that means as a way of offering a way into the world and a way of connecting. Um, when you think of, you know, well, if, if that is what I have, if that is the resource and the tale of my history, um, something that you had said, Harleen, um, as if displacement is the only steady, steady narrative of our, of our lives, um, that if your history is displacement, if it is uprooting, if it is deferral, if I can make of that a way back into the world and a way to connect, then that seems to me a kind of productive romance in the way that say Afro nostalgia might be. Um, so I thank you for that. Yeah, could I just, uh, sorry, Shala, had, Shala, is that your hand? Did you want to say something? Oh, okay. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Brandon, because, um, <laughs> so I have to tell you, I'm bringing something in. I was, um, interviewed by, uh, by a newspaper today for, um, they wanted to um, ask me about Bridgerton and the Indian characters in season two of Bridgerton. And, uh, you know, I had things to say about that and so on and so forth. But, you know, one of the things that they, at the end of it all, they just kind of asked me, so what do you think, et cetera. And, you know, and I said that I cannot unimagine slavery or racism or colonialism and displacement but there are moments in which to be able to imagine this white man falling in love with this Indian woman, that they're somehow on equal footing, that there's somehow a possibility of not, and of, you know, and of course I wanna break down the idea of romance as if somehow through romance, all the inequities are clear, cleared, you know, uh, there. But I was, you know, in thinking about Bridgerton, I wanted to at least give, you know, due acknowledgement of the role of the imagination in thinking about this, that there is, as you say, this productive space, that the imagination, whereas, you know, to be able, I mean, part of, I think, the, 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 the conundrum of return and what, you know, when I'm talking about for those who have no home as such, right, the, the bodies that are almost always on the margins of something, is the lack of this imaginary space. Right. It's not that just that that we are erased from history, but that we are erased from the imagination of history, from the historical imagination. And I and, and that's why I think when, when you said, you know, this idea of a kind of productive dreaming, you know, I, 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 I really, really like that um, because uh, the, this 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 notion of the imagination, not simply as. For those of us who grew up in the colonial system of, of schooling, right? Like, don't be lost in your daydreams. Don't be, don't be wandering off, looking off into the distance, you know, chin in hand and all of that. Um, that the idea of the imagination as, as a place of productive dreaming is so wonderful, is, is, uh, is so heartening, so liberating in, in many ways. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Maybe we can call on members of the audience now. Who it, this in this in this system? I cannot see them. 
but I imagine you out there because my thing says, my thing gives me a number of participants and it's more than those I can see. Questions, well, comments? I was looking at the chat, Faith, and, and so far there hadn't been anything in the chat because I thought that maybe people were in. Can I come with a Bridgerton thing while we while we check? Because I just <laughs> I, it's, this is season one. I just watched season two, but it's interesting to me. There's one way with the the story of the the first season's um, account with the black woman when she's getting um, assessed for the marriage market. They asked to, for her to exhibit her teeth, and the the man sort of um, and oh, it's just yeah. yeah right. It's so interesting because in 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 and this is I wonder what you think on this Harley in terms of season mm -hmm. two. But it's a moment where the, the, the nostalgia of being able to see this lushly embodied right. people occupying these roles who wouldn't is here shadowed by the auction block of slavery. Right. And I just wonder yes. if, um, I, if we have a question, I'll, I'll stop. But I just I want to talk to you about Bridget Chan. So we'll, but we'll... I think that's what but I think that's what rhymes does all the time or, or a rhymes world does all the time that when you when you don't expect it or maybe you do it or maybe we expect it too much and that's a problem that that's a that's a judgment that we make but it's always there so you so we think about even the conversations of the the origin of that particular dukedom or whatever you call it um the the that that it, that a, a place was made for this group so it's a reminder that there's nothing that for this group there's always a question attached to, to if, if a place was made for you then there's then there's always that that shadowing of mm. um, first of all it can be the place can be taken away, mm. and therefore there's a kind of label, you know, labored speech, labored gestures because it's as if even though you have it, you you know that it was given, and so therefore there's always this this sense of of anxiety attached to it. And I think that that's always built in to the thing. And quite frankly, let's look here. We're watching it for the sex. And I think <laughs> just, just claim it. There is a, it seems that there is a question. Um, it's a, it's, I, I think it's a comment. Oh, I don't, I don't see this. Is in it? It's, it's Dorothy Kim on, on the Q&A. Faith, if, the, if you go oh, in the Q&A, &A. okay. Oh yes, um, uh, Dorothy. Do you want to to ask the question or live or because it's I, a question, I, but I more just it. a way to open the conversation. Yeah, I'm wondering how settler colonialism and indigenous studies discussions of reciprocity and relations fits into this discussion of returns, especially as people have discussed. Uh, we've been talking about the nation state and settlement, and so what do we do with the question of indigeneity um, and how does how does that relation of reciprocity fit into this discussion? Interesting question actually. I, I'll, I'll, I mean, so when I invoke the nation state um, or when I invoke settlement or the impossibility of arriving, I'm actually invoking the project of settler colonialism. So, you know, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think about how it is that the project of settler colonialism um, creates a set of conditions where some of us are continually in the state of arriving, but never settling. Um, and and so, so for me, you know, the question of, indigenous relations of reciprocity um, comes to me in, in different kinds of ways. I mean, um, the question of how does that work in terms of black indigenous relations on Turtle Island and, and, and the archipelago um, between indigenous various kinds of indigenous communities, internal to indigenous communities, and so on. I'm going to suspend that part of it, but I think I think that you know, of course, there is a history of Black indigenous relations that that are based in reciprocity, and then there are some fraught tensions, and so I and that's and that's in part what I meant by also never arriving, mm -hmm. that there there are ways in which 
um, it's very easy to slip into the romance of reciprocity without accounting for the other side of that, which are the fraught relations, which are the complications of, of slavery, which are the complications of both um, contemporary ejections from community. Um, and so, so, but, but, the, but the, the nation state is an invention of European expansion and settlement and settlement, the kind of settlement that I don't ever want to arrive at and end in the Americas. So, so that's what I was hinting at, yeah. Yes. So, and I think, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just saying that I'm, I'm looking again at the, at, the, at the original thing, always arriving, but never to arrive. To arrive is to settle. And I'm hearing it differently now after Dorothy's yeah. question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, go ahead, Harleen. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think this is this is really important. I mean, the idea of fraud that you brought up, because again, as Hardin suggested, uh, uh, we in, we, sometimes it's easier to really go with the dominant kind of you know epistemologies and kind of forget that there are other systems, as we suggested. The idea of reciprocity has to be in a same system in order for it to even be imagined as such. So for, for those who came and settled, you know, to enter in that relationship itself was, uh, you know, was based on a different kind of power relations and so on and so forth. For people who did not even have the same con concept of property, uh, ownership and so on and so forth, the idea of reciprocity was different from what it was, uh, you know, imposed and forced and so on and so forth. So I think this is really significant. And I completely agree with you, Ronaldo, when you're saying this idea of arriving and imagining yourself at home almost makes you think, uh, you know, belonging to a different set, 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 um, community that has a different notion of glorious times that, is, that was not glorious for many, many people. It was the time of slavery, it was a time, you know, so, and, and has been for many others. So in that sense, I think I completely agree with you that we cannot really talk about these without thinking about the contentions, without thinking about what they actually entail even today. I mean, I, I, Brandon, you brought up in your code the idea of the dead still being the, the point of benefit. The ghost tours are still alive. The dead have, has to suffer for our pleasure. I mean, I think those ideas very much are part of what we are also talking about when we think about the indigeneity nowadays often is kind of a token, you know, is that, it, that, that, that it, it makes one you know, uncomfortable even in, in many ways. Um, so to the idea of home for colonial, I think it must be very different from how we imagine it. And, and for that reason, we become almost nomads of the world, I think, you know, and, and I would rather be nomads in a sense to poach and not make the settlers com remain comfortable than to become settler myself. Yeah, where I might jump in with that is, and, and this isn't um, a, a history I work so, so much on, but it's interesting. One thing I'll note about Ty Miles, and I'll swing to another point, is that Ty Miles is also a historian of Black and Indigenous histories. And so that is part of her project of, of reconstructing and going to these haunted plantation sites to see the kind of stories that traffic in American culture around this. I think in terms of mass culture and commodified stories, the most immediate one is the very over-circulated, which folks have many different relationships to, stories of the haunted Indian, Indian burial ground, which animates so much of Hara. And I'll note there that um, Leela Taylor, um, who has this wonderful memoir called Darkly, which is her account of herself as a black goth, um, turns as many do to poltergeist, to this account of an exclusive community that spilled over an Indian burial ground and um, the dead rise up and they, you know, 
chase the family out and so on. But her ending lines of her memoir is this account of like, you know, the world's not ending. It simply doesn't belong to you anymore. And I think about that, I think with, with even um, horror films like Amityville Horror, like another story which is tied to this indigenous burial ground plot where um, the, the sense that, you know, whether or not you acknowledge the land, the land doesn't acknowledge you. And the sense of like this really awful history that, you know, rises up and chases all the, the folks out is a, a scene which is very, you know, it's a mass culture fantasy, which is not produced for indiz- indigenous folks. Um, but I think it is a scene of identification where, you know, you can witness this scene of revenge played out where the ghosts you want to receive, receive return, sure, they do in a massively commodified form, you know, and in a very, you know, um, very poorly historicized trope. Um, but it does afford to the kind of horror viewer a sense of watching settlement overturned. Um, and then horror becomes actually the thing that is on your side um, in a really kind of lovely way. Sorry, I didn't know that this was a trope. Why, why does it have to be, I guess I'm, I guess I'm struck. Why does it have to be the Indian burial ground in, in all of these narratives? And in which, and in which narratives is this the trope? In, in, this is just a general, so in other words, in Stephen King, I'm, I'm sorry to be so ignorant. In, yeah, yeah, like, in I'm all, Stephen, it's just a general thing. Like Stephen King's Pet Cemetery okay. um, is a big one. Um, there's lots of, there's another one, I can't remember the, I can't remember the other one of his books, but it's just a very overused trope in but horror. always films. indigenous. That's right. That's right. Um, and I think it's, you know, as, as folks point about, pointed to, it's a sort of haunting as an unsettled American consciousness, which has never come to terms with what it does. But in these stories, there are no indigenous folks living in the present. Right. Um, maybe there's one wise one who comes in and, you know, this sort of thing. Um, but the thing is that, that I, from what I've read, like a lot of folks like are kind of tired because like, yeah, we get, that's the only way that indigeneity shows up in horror. Um, and yeah, but it's, it is a very, um, it's very prolific. Um, and so it comes up in ways that I don't always chase. Um, but yeah, Harleen, sorry. Well, it's, it's interesting too, right? That, that in, <laughs> in a way it's, it's, it's always the, the, the indigenous or the native or the person of color coming up as a ghost saying, what have you done to me? I mean, like, why don't white people show up as ghosts and say, we did wrong? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, wouldn't that be like, we shouldn't, wouldn't somebody, you know, be thinking about this and saying we did wrong? I mean, so in a way, once again, even in the realm of ghostliness, right, it's the it's the task of the brown people to tell us that we've done wrong. I mean, like, why doesn't why don't any of these horror films have someone like, you know, an old slave owner who shows up and says, holy crap, I shouldn't have been doing this. Where's my remorse? Where's my redemption in this way? Um, so I'm always struck by this, that, you know, when you mentioned the trope, but it, in a way, this it's also this trope where, you know, the righteous anger and the unrighteous anger and the rebellion and the, the protest is all within the brown and black body, mm. right? Why, why is it not the task <laughs> of, of, of the white colonial settler, right? Why is it not the task in, 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 in those ways? I, I, it's, it's, it's a hard thing also. I mean, and, you know, we mentioned we're talking about, um, as you said, you know, you acknowledge the land, but the land doesn't acknowledge you. And I'm always asking this question about, right, what are, what are we serving, right, in, in terms of, of even the, 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 the mantra of this, I mean, are we engaging with it? Or is this one more way of being conscientious in a public way that doesn't really allow for an accounting of sins, right? Do we, do we engage in this, yeah, you know, uh, simply as a way of laying the ghost to rest, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've had this, now we've acknowledged it. That's all we've ha- got to do. Um, I, but I have to say that, you know, when I, many, some years ago, I went to give a talk at York University in, in, in near, outside of Toronto. And, you know, over three days of conference at every event, a land acknowledgement was read out. Anytime a person went up to the podium, they let, you know, read. And first I kept thinking, hmm, I wonder what's going on, you know, I, why is it doing, but then there was, it dawned on me the effectiveness of a mantra, really, right, that when you hear it again and again and again, as much as I'm skeptical about what it, what is the work that it's really doing, I could not not acknowledge 
the effect that it was having on me and everybody at the conference to hear it again and again and again. And, mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm wondering if, if that too is a part of that, that kind of ghostly presence in the horror. I mean, of course, I'm thinking of Avery Gordon and, and all of that work, but I, I'm, I, you know, we're thinking of ghosts as something from the past, but I, I also wonder the ways in which the ghostliness is, 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 a, is a part of our present. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Harling, what you what you really made me think about, and I, I hope that we address the kind of reciprocity. I mean, that just let me say very quickly to to um to Dorothy Kim that I also think that the question that Zoe Todd's question of reciprocity is because Zoe is speaking from inside a specific indigenous community as well and, and inhabiting that space which is to say that reciprocity will read differently for others of us um, as, a, as, as, as a relation. But Harleen, your, your last comment there really made me think about um, some of the work that I know Christina Sharp is doing on the Justice Memorial and, and the lynching monument and thinking about another, and for me in, in, in the little bit that I know about that and, and that project where soil is collected from places where people were actually lynched, produces a different relationship to land as well, which I think in some way ties into a part of Dorothy's question. So, you know, this kind of question of, you know, blood at the roots, so to speak, um, is, is a really significant one for us to think about in relationship to, again, these questions of settlement and never arriving. That you know, while our blood might soak the ground in which we currently live, it is no indication of a, of a profound sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. That in fact, it's a marker of anything but belonging. And this is in fact the kinds of dynamics that when we think about the long jury of the afterlife of slavery that we, we come up against. So one of the conversations that I've had with my colleague here in Toronto, Eve Tuck, is to always think about, we, are, we, we continually have a conversation, we have an ongoing conversation, which my part of the conversation is to think about what it means to claim an, an identity that is not attached to land, right? And if the, if the, if the, if the conversation about contemporary indigenous resurgence is about the question of land, not only land back, but you know, home territories, being able to stake out where you came from, what your territories are, I would argue that that throws Black diaspora people into a certain kind of crisis because we, re we really can't make that claim, right? Um, they're thinking about this question of return. There are no home territories to return to. I was born in Barbados, but you know, that's not really a home territory. And the thing about, you know, when I invoke Dion Brand or or I invoke Austin Clark or I invoke Derek Walcott, you know, there's the sense in which, you know, the archipelago of the Caribbean is a place that really you should leave. <laughs> it's not it's not a place, you know, give, give it, given given the, the manner in which the colonial project structured it, um, you know, post-colonial disappointment. All of, all of this constitutes um, a difficult way to say that um, one has a kind of land, a territory to claim. And so that produces a particular kind of very interesting crisis for people who um, understand themselves in some relation to um, the, the, the significant ruptures of transatlantic slavery and colonization in the Americas. So you're making me think about Sandy Alexander's work on the, 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 the way in which lynching symbolic and material, symbolically and materially dangles, dangled one above the ground to say, this is the ground that you cannot have, right? Mm -hmm. So, that, so, that, so that, that's, that state of being in relation to land, but the relation to land is that you cannot you cannot have this. And so I'm 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 thinking about that 
and I'm and I'm still in the Indian burial ground trope because I want to know what happens in Black Horror. Does Black Horror re is is it in other words is it still the Indian burial ground in Black Horror, Brandon? I guess I want to ask you that. I'm so tempted to find a passage of this book, um, Leela Taylor's on um, Darkly. I, I I probably won't find it. It's a passage. What is it, Darkly? That's Darkly. Right. It's her That's memoir, right. her black um, goth memoir. I won't find it. But one of the things she talks about, and it and maybe sits with our relationship to the conversation of ungrounded, is the the sea being such a large burial ground in black diasporic thought, and how do you adapt? A, a visual, a generic language of haunting that is centered soil, that is centered houses, in order to speak to that experience of loss in which you can build no memorial, you know. Um, and so I think that some of the work that the some of the horror authors, um, scholars, and and um, and 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 filmmakers um, have been trying to render has been about trying to um, think of uh, how do you represent um experiences of haunting that you know there's no there's no record of like i think that one one thing that this came to me earlier in some of the conversations we we're having about the difficulty of trying to bring something back to return something um or return to something when there's no archive for it um what is ann savetkovich work on depression where she talks she's a beautiful chapter in Sidia hartman where she talks a little bit. Are you, are you leaving us, Harleen? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm listening to you. Where she talks a little bit about um, the, the productiveness of depression, um, academic forms of depression for Saidiya Hartman um, and trying to render and access a history of the enslaved that is inaccessible and how do you perform the kind of work when there's no archive for you? And I think that haunting and ghost stories has been a kind of way of of leveraging that um, for some of the writers that I'm working with. Um, and so there's there's multiple kinds, I'll say this briefly, of engagements. I think one of the most common refrains that I see um, is that um, Hara for the black viewer is never the, it's never the ghost, it's never the ghoul, right? it's never the vampire, but it's always black life that, you know, and this is the, the crucial centered shared text, I think is actually um, Romero's Night of the Living Dead, where at the end when the, spoiler, um, at the end where the the white um, mob are trying to come in and destroy all the zombies, they shoot the black lead, um, mistaking him as a zombie. And the, the refrain around that has been, even though Romero says he had no intention of casting a black actor with any awareness of that race should matter there, that that became the grounding scene for black horror scholars to say that this is, the horror for me is that white mob. You know, it's not the zombie and so on. And so, um, I think that the the way that black um, creators have entered into horror has been on one hand to try and shift some of the visual iconography, like his house on Netflix is a fantastic one to to check out for how that film renders the haunting sea of you know refugees escaping genocide and coming to experience um, xenophobia um, in the UK. Um, there's a really beautiful way to try and adapt that. Um, you know, spooky supernatural sense of horror to address real social um, problems that have always felt like the greater ghoul and beast um, for Black creators. So uh, maybe I'll pause there. Thank you. Can I say something just is nothing, you know, really. It's just that you reminded me of something, Brandon, as you were talking. Um, when I went to Iran during the, uh, and the BAM earthquake happened and BAM is a city in Iran and the 80% of it was basically ruined during the earthquake. So it was a very devastating, devastating situation. Anyways, and as I was talking to people and you know, people would talk about you know, how this was beautiful and so on and so forth and everything is ruined. And um, I went to a neighborhood that was completely gone. There was nothing literally but ruins. And, and, and a man told me that there was nothing beautiful here before. It's just gotten worse because, you know, so all of a sudden it was this idea of 
the nostalgia for the past, you know, when you're saying that for them is not the vampire, is not this, is not that, is the actually the reality of black life, the slavery. It's just hit me at the time also there that the lives that they were living was already, you know, so much so hard that even the earthquake did not seem to be like, oh my God, everything is ruined, you know. Uh, so it's it's really. I don't know, it's, it's, it's really to, to step back and think, you know, for, 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 for me at least, you know, just to sometimes to find yourself in a place of comfort and it, it's scary because the moment you do that, you realize to how many lives and how many, you know, precarious situations you're actually being, you know, kind of, you're losing sight of so many in that sense. And, and, and it's, it's just, I don't know. Uh, it just reminded me of that, that moment um, that you realize that life for many is still, you know, many of my colleagues during the COVID would say, oh, it was so nice. You know, I had time with my, you know, with my children, I had this. And, and when you realize, you know, what it means so, for so many families trapped in those little places, you know, with so many kids and not being able to even to afford. And so to return to normality for them, you know, uh, is, is totally different, is that right? So I don't know, it's just... Well, I don't know who who those colleagues were who were telling you about all this niceness. I, I have to tell you that, you know, after I had cooked the end meal, I was just had decided that my family eats too much. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of it, I was like, who needs three meals a day? <laughs> Dave. And I'm sure that many others felt the same way. Felt yeah. the same way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, I, I, I want to, sorry. Uh, Sorry, no, I, but I take, you know, take up your point on this, which is that, you know, because I, I, I also had a very um, strong reaction to, to people talking about, you know, this, the new normal as such, et cetera. The new normal, you know, is built upon a certain vision of privilege. You know, the new normal is not available to everyone. You know, not everybody can pick and choose the new normal. And mm -hmm. those of us who were able to work remotely, who were able to have lives that, you know, did not require us to be there, um, we were very privileged and we were extremely lucky for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because it, it certainly was not the case. And, and uh, I think that that's one of the things that we, you know, in, in the politics of return and the politics of what we agree upon, I guess one of the things when we started, I was trying to get at is that, you know, to, for me, the leaving and return is such a binary mm -hmm. that for lives that don't really fit that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that there is a way in which uh, the very question sometimes begs an engagement because, mm -hmm. you know, not everybody can leave and not everybody can return. I mean, you mentioned, you know, kind of a nomadic lifestyle, but, you know, sometimes we think about nomads also in a very romanticized way, yeah. but, but nomads are also no, nobodies, right? In a way they, they do not belong and they are persecuted almost everywhere they go. Yeah. I mean, in fact, really? there's hardly a nomadic existence, you know, of, of traditional communities, which has not been persecuted. So, it's yeah. it's a particular kind of nomadism that 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 is rooted in in our you know class and privilege. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm extremely thankful for that. But I but I did want to acknowledge your point about you know yeah. that this is, this is certainly right. not available to everybody. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And nomadic only a sense of imaginary is something we can really think about because especially in our communities, I mean, they were really you know squeezed in many ways and persecuted and 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 um you know stigmatized and so on and so forth so absolutely true so when i'm when i talk about nomadic only is in a sense of imaginary right. in a sense that we all realize that this world in many ways cannot be our home the way it is 
and and I think that's really the idea. But but you know when I was watching a documentary recently made by this uh, anthropologist, Iranian anthropologist, French Iranian anthropologist, and and it's very strange the way she goes back to find the traces of the mother and the aunt who were executed in Iran. And, when she, and she was a child, so she sent to, to France anyways, and she actually studies in, 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 uh, in Canada. But anyways, um, one of the things that she's talking about is the way the, the graves are now being developed as roads and freeways and, and so on. So, so everything gets lost. So as you're su suggesting, even the return is the return of hunting. One can never leave because the past is really never past. And so in that sense, that's what I was kind of trying to really talk about when we talk about different kind of thinking about temporality, different kind of thinking. So th 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 there is in a way in that sense, never even a sense of, you know, home or returning for these families because everything gets lost in this development that, you know, it reminds me of Benjamin's, you know, the, 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 this uh, storm of progress and you constantly with your head back, but pulling forward. There is never really that chance of being able to either let go of the past. So it's, and for us, the, the ethics then becomes can you really then reflect on the past in a different way or be part of the past? You know, when one thinks about, for instance, some of the Australian, um, you know, kind of uh, artists, um, indigenous artists, uh, thinking about their art as the dreaming of the ancestors, the ancestors coming and giving them the idea of the art and them only in a way in their mind, only now giving, voice to that or form to that, there is a different kind of ownership of the art in that yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. A different kind of thinking about knowledge production in that sense. Can Sorry. I ask a question to which to, to Ronaldo as well, since Ronaldo, you're, you're you know, also a diaspora scholar. I mean, in, in this whole conversation about, you know, the nomadic existence, the return and the leaving and the coming and so on and so forth. I'm also wondering what it means. Um, and, and, and maybe you had something else to say, of course, Ronaldo, but I hope you will think about this with me is, um, I mean, how do we think about return for diasporic communities, right? In the sense that, for example, um, right now, I was born and brought up in India and maybe, you know, and left, and maybe I can think of one point of origin and leaving and return. But I've also come to see myself as someone who has roots in Trinidad, <laughs> who has roots in, you know, in Kenya, who has roots in South Africa, who has roots in Guyana, who has now roots in London, in England, and right? So wherever we have these diasporic Fiji, wherever there are these diasporic communities of Indians, um, you know, um, I've begun to try to see myself through not just the binary of home country and where I am, but also about how, you know, I'm kind of refracted through all of these diasporic locations as well. And I wonder what, what you think about that uh, in terms of diaspora and move. I would love to hear more about it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's what Stuart Hall points to as the kind of second moment of, of diaspora, where the question of subjectivity becomes more important than the question of an original homeland and, 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 and where the question of representation and relationship to how one thinks about oneself in the world, the, this kind of making and renewal that might be tied to particular kinds of geographies, but it's not simply um, a function of those geographies. So, so diaspora then in that conception, it's less about a homeland and more about the possibilities of a certain kind of renewal in, in other places and spaces. Um, but I, I, there was something that Brandon said when Brandon moved to um, the Darkly memoir and this kind of question of the Atlantic as a burial ground. And it made, like, you know, in my last book, The Long Emancipation, I tried to mobilize three terms to think about the death of Africans crossing the Mediterranean, the Strait of Gibraltar, and mobilize Kamal Braffitt's notion of catastrophe, um, 
I see that crossing as a continuation of the of the of the middle passage um, going in another direction. And I mobilize um, the readers hauntology because I see those deaths as continuing to haunt us in the same manner as the deaths of the Atlantic. And I mobilize Christina Sharp's notion of in the wake um, to think about how we live in, in the wake of those deaths, in the wake of those ships and so on. And those three, those three concepts that these three different thinkers work with, are, were re it really helped me to think about the moment that we're in now too. So there's a way in which if the Atlanta is a burial ground, many of the public health measures that we had to live with in the first eventful moments of, of COVID meant that lots of black people died, lots of poor people died, lots of people of color died. And we were not able as Barbara Christian would say in this amazing essay on Beloved called Beloved Fixing Methodologies, that we were not able to put our dead to rest in ways that would allow them to rest. And she's writing about that and thinking about the Atlantic as this, as this watery graveyard. And so, you know, you really made me think about that and then think about, I know you invoked it, Brandon, in your, in your talk. You invoked, I think, with the title of Audre Lorde's collection, Our Dead Behind Us. Um, but you definitely, I think you used that phrase, Our Dead Behind Us, but made me think about, you know, this kind of question of how we deal with death. And, and the kind of question of haunting, because, you know, the haunting is not, there's, there's, one, there's one kind of haunting that's represented in, in, in a certain kind of white oriented cinema, I'm going to phrase it that way. And then there's the haunting of the everyday that appears that that is, that it, the haunting of the everyday that is actually the banal lives that some of us live, meaning that we know that we can't put our day to, to rest in loving ways. Meaning that we know, even going back to your question, Harleen, about diaspora, that it is almost impossible for us to claim one place and be able to um, have, a, have the kind of consciousness of life that will be satisfactory. That in fact, to claim one place might be more repressive than to say, I have a relation to Guyana, to Fiji, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. so it's kind of, so this, this question of kind of movement and circulation, um, literally physical movement, but also ideological and consciousness um, is, is really tied up also in the question of, of what haunts us, of what drives us, of what is possible. I mean, I could I could chime in. I think that was really um, powerfully and, and lovely said. Um, I think that it's it's interesting that the the sense of not having um, access to I'm trying to remember as you put it, but not having access to like a kind of archive or seeing this kind of repetition of traumas of the middle passages that are stockpiled everywhere. I'm so interested in kind of um, the sort of almost I, I'm I'm not going to stick to this phrase like almost like guerrilla process of burying the Black dead in scenes of representation that are not explicitly about Black life. That really has been with me because that like what really interested me is like I, I know the kind of text that we might go to to see how haunting the haunting of Black life plays out. Um, I'm interested in a sort of poetic set. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of Black queer poets undertaking right now that experience um, traumatic forms of repetition of triggering in images that are not actually suited at all to represent Black life. And the one thing, yeah, I do not have it with me, um, but there's, there's, one, um, uh, there's one poet, Justin Philip Reed, who is watching a, a number of um, horror films, Scream, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween. And there's one scene where in um, Nightmare on Elm Street where a person of color is hung by Freddy in a dream sequence in a prison cell and is not actually, um, it's Freddy Krueger killing him, but he's just found in a prison having you know, been murdered um, in a cell by himself. When Reed writes about this, he's actually writing from the scene of remembering Sandra Bland and thinking about how does 
black death just happen, you know, incidentally in the hands of black, of white captors of the police. And there's so many kinds of archives in these moments that are able to see the repetition, the, the being in the wake um, of scenes of black women um, being, their, their deaths being neglected by the state candy man comes up, right? Um, but there's also this other kind of archive of saying, I'm so haunted that I see this everywhere. Even when I'm not seeing a scene that is about my life, about my suffering, I see it even when I'm only seeing you. Um, and I think that those really hit me in a different way because all of a sudden the structuring of a, of a, haunted, of a haunted consciousness is that the horrors of black life returns even when you're watching films about white people. Um, and that to me is so hard because it shows, you know, there's that, that street in this, um, I'll stop, I'll say this and stop here because I, I want to be conscious of time. Um, but it shows that even when we're streaming television, say, and trying to escape from the news footage that haunts us, I think of Claudia Rankin's Don't Be Lonely, that haunts us, there is still, say, right, Bridgerton season one, they're still seeing the ghost of the auction block in these kind of moments. There's still these repetitions, these returns that draw us back to a scene of witness witnessing that doesn't let go of us, even when we chose to watch something where we don't have to face it. And I think that those um, those kind of um, hauntings and the, the, the I, I have to read your, I've, I've read Career, Career Returns, it's a beautiful book. I haven't read your, your prior work and now you're sending me that way. Um, but I think that your invocation to see that history of repetitions of the middle passage and to feel that haunting of it in that way, um, to, it, it sits within that, that sort of traumatized way of seeing perhaps, I'll pause there. Yeah. Thank you, 828. What I'm hearing there is the, we're being interpolated, right? By the, by the, the, the television show or whatever it is, in part because, so, so there's, a, there's a show doing its work on us, but it is, but in, in part it's doing its work on us because we're available for that work because of the weight of the past and memory and so on, right? And so I'm I'm thinking of I'm 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 thinking of that that that, that at least double edge as well. It's eight twenty eight, and I want to thank everyone who's attended, even though I couldn't see you. Um, thank you for your presence and for your um, attention and attentiveness, as as um, registered, for instance, in in Dorothy Kim's um, question. Thank you so much to this panel, just amazing and stimulating and powerful. And it will be echoing for a long time, at least I know for me. I want to thank Stacey Lance again, and um, to also thank um, the, the, core, the, 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 the persons who um, co-organized this um, with me. Um, uh, Elora and Kareem, and I want to say good night to everyone and blessings. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.